The year is 2011. You've just finished explaining Facebook to your angry uncle and thought to yourself that this couldn't possibly lead to anything bad and Facebook will be the best thing ever for the rest of human existence. Maybe you spent your evening swooning over the Taylor Swift, Jake Gyllenhaal relationship because that's definitely gonna be the one that sticks. Or maybe you're a Potterhead and you've seen Deathly Hollows part two nine times in the theater. Or maybe, just maybe, you're a PC gamer who wants the very best of the very best. You've got your eyes set on playing games like Skyrim, Batman Arkham City, and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. And you've got a healthy budget to make it happen. Well, today we're gonna take a time machine 10 years into the past to see what that experience would have actually been like. Not the angry uncle thing on Facebook. That, that didn't end well for anybody. Simple yet stylish, the Be Quiet Dark Power 12 is everything you need in a high-end power supply. From its 80 plus titanium certification to its fully modular cable design, Be Quiet left no box unchecked, and they even provide you an easy way to boost your overclocking performance with the flip of a switch. Rest easy with Be Quiet's 10 year warranty and enjoy some of the most efficient and reliable power delivery in the industry with the Dark Power 12. Check out the link below to learn more. Thanks so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you like what you see here and want to see more, please consider hitting that subscribe button down below and maybe even dropping a comment or a like. It does help out a ton. The last time I took on a project where I was building a dream machine from 10 years in the past, it was 2017. And I put together an SLI build from 2007. Now, while that PC came out great and surprisingly trouble-free, that hardware was, even in 2017, not really relevant at all anymore. However, today's build, I think, carries a little more importance in today's PC gaming landscape. 2011 saw the introduction of Sandy Bridge processors and the amazing Intel i7-2600K. While clearly long in the tooth, it still feels much more like a modern CPU than the Core 2 generation that came before it. And in fact, I'm sure there are still many of you out there rocking this very chip. It has four cores and eight threads and turbos up to 3.8 gigahertz. Of course, the lithography is quite dated and the IPC is painful, but this was by all measures the best gaming CPU on the planet for quite some time. My original intention was to pair the CPU with the EVGA Z68 for the Win motherboard. Not only was this one of the best overclocking platforms for the 2600K, but it also supported up to four-way SLI configurations and had some crazy features for a product from 2011. It has onboard power and reset, a dual bio selector switch, substantial VRM cooling, and an LED postcode readout, which is how I knew this board was actually dead. I got it via eBay and it came without the cover on the socket, but wrapped tightly in bubble wrap. I think in shipping that bubble wrap must have pressed down onto the pins because when I unwrapped everything, there were quite a few bent contacts. I tried to repair it, but no dice. And I couldn't find another one of these boards anywhere. I resorted to the next best thing, the Z77 for the win. While not technically 2011 appropriate as it was released a year later, the Z77 still rocked the same awesome feature set as its predecessor. A triple bio switch is at the bottom of the board and you can find an LED postcode readout and power and reset switches on the top. You also have two separate CMOS resets and a power LED indicator for each PCIe slot, of which there are many. Memory for this project was pretty simple to figure out. Corsair Vengeance DDR3 was some of the best around at the time and I picked up this 4x8 gigabyte kit of DDR3 1600CL9 from an eBay listing and thankfully it arrived perfectly functional without issue. I have a bunch of DDR3 but wanted to use something other than Dominator Platinum for this build and 32 gigs for a 2011 Dream System seems like the right amount. I did take some inspiration for this from a Maximum PC article, and this is what they used as well, so I felt pretty good about it. Next up was our graphics solution, and this was a little more tricky to figure out. 2011 was still the age of SLI and Crossfire, with most super high-end builds featuring two, three, or even four graphics cards. The 2007 Dream System used two 8800 GTXs, so I figured I had to at least match that configuration. Well, we actually did one better. The NVIDIA GTX 580 was released in November of 2010, 
and there was no GTX 580 Ti or 580 Super follow-up. This was it, the best gaming GPU on the market for 2011, but we weren't going to settle for one or even two of them. Three-way SLI was the way to go here, and even with 10-year-old hardware, I expected to be able to achieve some really solid 1080p frame rates with this much overall horsepower. The problem that I ran into actually though had nothing to do with the GPUs themselves. The power supply I chose to use for this was a modern 1000 watt thermal take unit, which had enough PCIe connectors, or so I thought. As it turns out, the EVGA Z77 for the win has a supplemental power connector on the motherboard that is required when running more than one GPU. Supplemental power connectors are not unusual to see, but they are usually only useful when doing sub-zero overclocking. I had never seen a board before that simply wouldn't function without it. So in order to solve this problem, I had to connect a second power supply, but just to the supplemental PCIe power connector on the motherboard during testing. I did manage to close the side panel so that thermals were still at least mostly accurate, but this did throw me for a loop there for a second, and I spent a good amount of yesterday trying to figure out what exactly was going on. The case I chose was a bit of a throwback for me, I built in the Corsair Graphite 600T White Edition back around this time, and I remember really liking it for the component spacing, cable routing, and ease of use. In fact, it still is really functional with an easily removable side panel and a, you know, fairly small acrylic window. This, of course, was a secondhand case and one apparently that came from a Digital Storm pre-built, but it came with an unexpected, period-correct surprise. Cold cathode lighting. These lighting tubes were RGB before RGB was RGB. In fact, it's just kind of R. They were clunky to wire up and often required a control box and auxiliary power, but they were the best we had back in the day and I chose to leave them in place. Getting everything functional on this build was a chore. At first, the motherboard didn't even want to post and I had to try all three BIOSes before one finally worked. Then I had to figure out the supplemental power situation and then enabling three-way SLI took another decent chunk of time. Once all of that was sorted, I had to implement some old school NVIDIA profile inspector hacks to get SLI working in the titles that I chose to play. Because while SLI was much more common in 2011 than it is today, some games still did not come with support baked in. I chose to test out five different games, Batman Arkham City, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 and The Elder Scrolls Skyrim were some of the biggest titles released in 2011. The Witcher 3 came out a few years later but is known to have excellent SLI scaling, and Far Cry 5 is a modern title that does support SLI, so I figured I'd have a nice cross-section of results to look at. Batman Arkham City was up first and ran between 100 and 130 frames per second with all cards hitting 60 to 90% utilization. Frame time consistency was good with only a few small hiccups, but the game was overall very smooth and looked great. All of these games were run at 1080p and high or ultra settings. You can see the GPUs were getting a little toasty here over 80C, but that's what happens when three cards are sandwiched together like that. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 was next and hit 100 to 120 frames per second, but the cards only sat between 35 and 45% utilization. This does tend to make me lean towards a CPU bottleneck, but overall the frame time consistency was excellent with almost no stuttering or hitching. This was a great gaming experience and highly playable. The GPU sat in the 70C range during this test. On The Witcher 3, things started to get a little hairy. I was seeing 30 to 35 frames per second and some odd behavior from the GPUs. The top two cards were loaded between 80 to 90%, and clocked appropriately, but the bottom card sat at 51 megahertz and wouldn't budge. The frame time consistency was also terrible, with lots of stuttering and jerky movements and transitions. This was not a playable experience. The Elder Scrolls Skyrim was also a bizarre one. All three GPUs were loaded between 60 and 70%, which is appropriate. The frame rate for this game caps at 60, and for the most part, that's what I saw. A locked 60 FPS on the screen at all times. However, there was terrible visual artifacting and ghosting whenever I looked at a character model. It's almost like the game was rendering out two different versions of the scene and then kind of layering them on top of each other, just slightly off center. Although the game was running smoothly, it was not playable. 
And we saved the best or the worst for last. I was hoping that we could brute force some playable 1080p gameplay out of a modern title with Far Cry 5. And indeed, while standing still, the game looked great and was running between 40 and 42 FPS. However, even the slightest movement caused huge spikes in frame times and crazy drops in resolution. The entire screen looked like it dropped down to 240p when it had to redraw something. And then as soon as I started walking, the game just crashed. This was unfortunately very repeatable. As this is a modern title and the CPU was loaded at 90% or higher, it's clear that 2600K just couldn't keep up with the appropriate draw calls to the GPUs as their utilization was only in the 30% range. So here is your 2011 dream system. Back in the day with some crazy 10,000 RPM storage solution or even an SSD or two, this build probably would have cost you about $5,000. Today, I was able to assemble it for a few hundred bucks. Is it still viable? Well, no, probably not for modern gaming, but the 2600K still has some legs to it and the GTX 580 would probably do okay on some esports titles. However, projects like this aren't meant to be an example of what to build in 2021. They're a great exercise to examine how hardware has evolved over time, what lessons we've learned, and what maybe we should go back to in the future. Personally, I miss SLI setups. They were quirky, frustrating, expensive, and cool as hell. Building a system like this is a time machine, letting you reflect on past projects, old LAN parties, gaming sessions with friends, or whatever else you had going on in your life at that point. And as time continues its unrelenting march forward, maybe someday you'll pick up two RTX 3090s and an AMD 5950X from eBay for $300 and think to yourself, hey, you remember when we couldn't buy these things at all? So thanks so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video and have a great day.